This time on Only in America. How does a workforce become a family? Eight or ten years trying to get this immigration reform done and hearing the stories of these families being torn apart because, you know, of, of their parents being here and some of them got to be shipped back and the kids are still left here. And, you know, it, it breaks your heart. It tears your heart out. It's like, that's, that's not right. We need, we need to do something to get this figured out. And do America's towns and cities need liberating? We've gotten many of them out already. You know, we're pretty much at the 50% mark. We're getting them out as fast as we can get them out. We're freeing up towns. We're actually liberating towns, if you can believe that we have to do that in the United States of America. But we're doing it, and we're doing it fast. From the National Immigration Forum, welcome to Only in America. One by one, we are liberating America's towns and cities. This is what President Trump told an audience in Youngstown, Ohio in late July. I'm not sure there's ever been a more powerful summation of Trump's current approach to immigration. The president clearly sees immigration as a threat to American culture. Maybe things will change. Maybe they won't. Since April of this year, I've traveled to dozens of cities talking to a range of audiences about my book, There Goes the Neighborhood. Each conversation has a different flavor to it. In late July, I was at the Los Angeles Central Library's Allowed Lecture Series, and I was asked a question I've never been asked, a question that has stuck with me. Pilar Moreto, a columnist with the influential newspaper La Opinion, had interviewed me that evening. About 30 minutes into the event, she opened things up for questions from the audience. Most of the questions were pretty straightforward, versions of which I had heard at other events. But as the event convener announced, we would only take a couple more questions from the back of the auditorium, a woman raised her hand. She had brown, curly hair, glasses, and spoke with an urgency and an emotion I had not heard in any other book talk. She began with, I don't know if this is your realm or not. Her emotion checked my natural tendency to crack wise that I'm always willing to make up an answer. Instead, sensing that emotion, I found myself leaning forward in my seat. She told me about her friend's experience in Santa Paula, a community north of Los Angeles in Ventura County. Santa Paula is known as the citrus capital of the world. She told me, while they were eating in this restaurant, immigration and customs enforcement came in, as the auditorium listened. She went on, the white customers were allowed to stay seated and eat their meal. Everybody else was lined up and asked for immigration documentation. On the stage, my mind immediately clicked to President Trump's speech. Towns and cities needed to be liberated of immigrants. Was this the liberation of Santa Paula? The woman went on, her voice picking up a bit. The children in the community are in terror. They're locking doors, and they're afraid to go to school. At this point, the auditorium was dead silent. I was expecting a legal question to follow. What are the rights people have? What should immigrants do in this context? Do you know any good lawyers? Instead, she asked a question that keeps jolting me awake. What do we tell the children? This is Ali Nurani. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the Walmart Foundation, so retail sector employees can receive contextualized English language training through our project, Skills and Opportunity for the New American Workforce, and from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, established in 1911 by Andrew Carnegie to promote the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding. Now here's Megan Smith from Spartanburg, South Carolina, with a brief word on the value immigrants bring to America. Immigrants matter to me because I think that each person is made in the image of God and everyone has a God-given dignity. And so regardless of your country of origin or your language or what your documentation status is, I believe you matter to God and therefore you matter to me. And some of my best friends are immigrants and they bring such a vitality to our churches, our communities, our schools, and I believe that we need to stand with them. I traveled for much of August through America's heartland. Deep into the cattle plains of Idaho, I met an old friend. Since coming to Idaho in 2001, Tony Vanderholst had found himself unwittingly in the vanguard of the America's immigration debate, along with his colleagues who lead the Idaho Dairymen's Association. 
They wonder how they would sustain their industry without the help of the people they call family, the thousands of Hispanic workers they employ on their dairies. At Tony's Dairy, where they have about 5,000 cattle, the economic future is a constant concern. But the real work goes on, and it starts early. You know, people get there at 5 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we start getting the cows fed. We've got a team of guys that are out there basically getting the cows up and locking them up so we can take a look at each cow or lock them up. And where we go through them, we've got a team of guys that vaccinate, breed the cows, move cows, and just look for sick animals. And it's just a, just a daily routine. It's like like a, like a little city that when when the people get there, we wake them, we, we get them up, and and everybody starts doing their stuff. And our cows are like the people in the city. They're all they're all looked looked after, and they're we're within an hour and a half, two hours. Each pen is let go, and and they're um, they they lay down and go back to what they got to do: make milk. <laughs> So give me a sense of kind of how you have seen, you know, not just the state change, but, you know, where, where the dairy is and kind of how has the community changed um, as, you know, the, the dairy industry has grown, as, you know, different people have moved in, um, as your own family has grown. When we moved uh, to Idaho in 2001, we um, started the West Point Farms, and it was uh, more, we had employees that came to us looking for work, and, you know, you, we have some key people that have been with us for the 17 years we've been there, and on the dairies, it's it's uh, we have we have probably like a probably a 30 percent turnover rate annually at least, and we get all the information we need from them. You know, when we hire them, they're the Hispanic. Mostly of them are the Hispanic community, just a good group of people. And we've been working with them for like I said, 17 years, and we got some key people that have been with us for a long time. Just, just some good, great people. Great people. Um, the kids went to school with, with, with some of them, some of their families. Uh, you, you get to know them. And you know, my job, you know, the people that I'll work with, uh, you know, I've known some people for you know, twelve, thirteen, fourteen years as well, and you kind of see the same thing. Right. Um, but I don't think that uh, people see that. Uh, understand that dairy owners, much less at, you know growers or farmers in general, have that sort of relationship with their workforce. Um, why do you you know why do you, why do you think that is? You know you're you're out there with these guys every day working with them. You're vaccinating your cows. You're moving cows around with them. You know looking at dry cows. You know the animals that need to be moved to the to the close up pen. And you just build up a camaraderie with each other. They become family. You work with these guys every day, day in and day out. You become friends. You know they have the respect for you because you're their boss. You know you got to. You know they're working for you, but still, you know they, you know there's that connection that uh, that's that, that that's cool. That's pretty awesome. You know we get invited to you know the, the kids' quinceañeras um, here a while back. Uh, one of my guys had a had a set of you know his set of twins. They're four or five years old. We get invited to their baptism, and then you get the whole community where they gather together there's probably 200 people there they got a band they got a they you know they they they, they cook a uh, a pig in the ground pig or two in the ground tony tony just come by come by for a little while or whatever so we do of course we do it, it you know and, and and you eat with them you just have a great time with them and and when you walk in the room they all look, hey, hey, there's Tony, there's the boss, there's the boss. It just makes you feel good that they look up to you as a person. I'm, I'm no better than they are, but for me, it, you know, for them to see me come walking in the door sometimes, it's like, hey, oh man, thank you, Tony, for coming. And we're all human. Wouldn't have it any other way, you know? It's pretty cool. And when you got into the business, you know, back in California and New Mexico and moved here, did you expect that sort of a dynamic with, you know, with, your, with the Latino Hispanic workforce? In New Mexico, I had I was there 11 years also, and I had a few people that worked for me for quite some time too. The main thing is you treat them right, they'll treat you right, and then that's just the way it is. We're all we're all uh, in it together. So then we were talking about um, you know the issue of immigration reform, and um, you're talking about having been active on this and for 10 years. Was there a moment in your career where you realized that okay, this is an issue that I have to care about? It's it's been an issue, you know, me being an, the son of immigrants and the importance of our industry. When did it really hit me? But it's, it's, it's always hit me that, that we, we need help. You know, when year after year, the past few years, we've, you know, eight or 10 years trying to get this immigration reform done. And hearing the stories of these families being torn apart because, you know, of, of their parents being here, 
and some of them got to be shipped back and the kids are still left here and you know it, it breaks your heart it tears your heart out it's like that's that's not right we need we need to do something to get this figured out every industry relies on immigration on the backs of these folks that are here whether they're here legally or illegally we got to feed the world and how are we, how will we do it otherwise because there's not enough people that can do it themselves or or we can't do it all ourselves so we need people and we open up our doors to whoever wants to come in to work and 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 uh, these folks are the ones that, that that are coming so then over the last you know few years as you said as things have gotten bad or, or worse and you know you go to DC you you know sit down with a member of congress or you're in Boise you sit down with a state legislator uh, what's the story that you tell them you know what's the story that you tell them about your dairy and, and the people that you've gotten to know they're like family you know they're they're here they're, they're working for us we're treating them well and you build a camaraderie together it's it just it's just part part of part of life and, and we need them all and and um, there are buddies like I said there are buddies and to see a buddy get you know are they legal or not or one of their friends get deported or you know it, it, it just it just breaks your heart so where do you think this all goes? And not just from a policy perspective, you know, as the community in, in southern Idaho changes, how do you see kind of the state grappling with it? How do you see people who've been your, who've been in Idaho for generations? Yeah, you know, how do they struggle with this? And, and, you know, how in your role do you think you help people understand that you know, demographic change is a good thing? You know, as, as our role, I think telling our, telling our story. You know, they're, they're all good people, and we all have bad apples in a group it don't matter who you are you know where, where we're at or who we're who we're friends with things happen once in a while but for me to step out and 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 advocate for them i guess i'm glad i'm I, i'm glad i'm doing it because somebody's got to do it it frightens you but it's reality and if it was me in their shoes i'm glad somebody's doing it for us yeah. we gotta we gotta step it up we gotta can't be afraid anymore the reason why I've come to really admire and respect, you know, the Idaho Dairyman Association, yourself, yourself, Bob, and really the entire organization is that, like you said, you see the people that you work with as more than, you know, cogs in the wheel. They're an extension of your community, an extension of your family. And um, I think we have to figure out ways where the American public is seeing that, that story as well. Uh, and that's the challenge. And that doesn't happen quickly. And a lot of terrible things happen along the way. You know, my, my kids, you know, went through the whole school system in Wendell. And a lot of their buddies were buddies of, of the people that work on the dairies. And they're all good families. You know, it don't matter who we are. We're all in this together. And, and they implant themselves into the communities and they become citizens. Or they become football players. They become presidents of, the, of, the, of their class. And then, and then they're making they're making a part of their life. It's 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 their life now. And to get this get, get uh, something, one of their parents get get shipped away or shipped off back to Mexico. You know, I can see why if there's a bad one, you know, you get them out of here. But but how many bad ones are there? You can find out more about Tony and the Idaho Dairy Farms at our website, immigrationforum.org. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Next, what would the RAISE Act mean for America's workforce and the future of American society? And what are the alternatives? I'm Ali Nirani. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the Walmart Foundation, so retail sector employees can receive contextualized English language training through our project, Skills and Opportunity for the New American Workforce, and from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, established in 1911 by Andrew Carnegie to promote the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding. A random road trip across nine states, Wyoming, Vermont, Arkansas, North and South Dakota, Delaware, Montana, Rhode Island, New Hampshire. Total population of these states, 7.8 million people. Keep that in mind. Earlier this summer, Senators Purdue and Cotton introduced the RAISE Act, the Reforming American Immigration for Strong Employment Act. 
So this legislation is where the rhetoric is beginning to define the policy. The legislation seeks to slash legal immigration 50% by proposing major cuts to family-based immigration and creating a point system for the current cap on employment-based immigration. The anti-immigration movement has long used the debate around the undocumented as a shroud to their ultimate goal of severely cutting immigration to the United States. The RAISE Act is their holy grail, and it's going to shape the debate for years to come. So let's be honest here. The anti-immigration lobby has succeeded in conflating the policy questions of legal immigration, refugees, and the undocumented to become a powerful and toxic cultural debate which preys on the fears and anxieties of millions of Americans. The Raise Act did draw some immediate opposition from key Republicans. Speaker Paul Ryan, among others, has acknowledged America faces a serious labor shortage when he recently told his constituents, quote, with baby boomers leaving the workforce, we're still going to have labor shortages in certain areas. And that is where a well-reformed legal immigration system should be able to make up the difference. The Raise Act would reduce the rate of economic growth in the United States by an estimated 12.5% from its projected level. Frankly, at a time in our history when we can least afford it. In fact, the American Action Forum found that by 2020, our economy will face a shortage of private sector workers totaling 7.5 million, which is pretty close to the total population of my nine-state road trip. Cutting immigration to address a massive worker shortage is like paying your credit card bill with another credit card. At some point, the math will just catch up. The Raise Act is certain to be mired in the deadlock Congress for some time. But the public debate begins. Let us know how you feel about it at immigrationforum.org slash podcast. And that's all for this edition. Our podcast is produced by the staff of the National Immigration Forum. I'm Ali Nirani with Only in America. Thank you.